All right, 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM listeners, you already know what time it is. And right here, right now, we actually have the one and only. We have legendary publicist, music producer. This individual has been doing his thing for multiple years within the music industry. We have the one and only Jonathan Hay right here, live on the line. How are you doing this evening? Uh, thank you. And I got to say, first and foremost, John, because I know you're a very busy guy, so I'm just going to dive right into this interview. But I want to take you back to the beginning, man. And I have to ask, like, what actually made you decide to get into the music industry initially? Because, you know, you, you did so much legendary stuff so far on, so far on in your career. Yeah, so, like, I was in Louisville, Kentucky, which was, like, very country, um, not quite developed. So, like, when I got into hip-hop, it was, like, the MTV raps and... Um, you know, it was, like, very, like, underground and taboo, like, you know, to, to, like, kids today get music so easy back then, especially in the South, it was real, real hard to get hip-hop, but I fell in love with hip-hop, you know, like, Public Enemy, like, me and Rock Kim, Big Daddy Kane, you know, like, the whole golden era of hip-hop, NWA, like, and I was the X-Clan, and I was just, like, pretty much, like, raised on hip-hop it changed my whole life the hip-hop culture and, and everything else so i was i was actually in college and uh this I, I had to do a public speaking course and um i met this the, one, one of my classmates his name is brian jackson he told me about this recording studio that did hip-hop right um like three blocks away so i, I went to i went to the studio with him and next thing you know we started recording on like the Fast Jam four track and A track, all that stuff, A Bat, Staff Players, and we started making, you know, music. <clears throat> and then I met this kid. It was real weird. He walked down the street. My 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 parents were like, you know, don't hang out hang out with him because he wear like trench coats and long hair, look crazy, like a crazy rocker kid. He was like fifteen, but something about him drew me in. He was always staring at the ground and real weird. <clears throat> and I brought him to the studio. And, uh, you know, he started singing on hooks and recording. And then he went and did, like, his own thing. And he ended up selling, like, you know, three million records. And then once I saw that, you know, then I started working with him again. And, you know, that, that kind of got my foot in the door. It was very, you know, it was very, uh, got very lucky. You know, I would travel to, you know, from Louisville, I would go to Los Angeles. I would look on the back of CDs. Um, you know, I'd get, like, their addresses or tapes because there wasn't an internet back then. Like, people don't even understand how, you know, you get on the internet so you look in the back of the record. So, like, I traveled to L.A. thinking that we'd get a record deal. And, <laughs> you know, we didn't because it's like, who the fuck are you guys here? You know, like, what are you doing? So it's like, you know, we'd sleep in the car. You know, we bathed by the beach because, you know, I didn't want to call my mom and say, hey, you know, I could go to college and do music. So it's like, you know, we'd sell our plasma. You know, we'd do day labor you know, and I was a kid, and I was, like, seeing, like, this whole other side that I've never seen of the world just going through the struggle, and that's what it took, you know. Um, it took it, it took that kind of dedication, you know, and it took that kind of determination to to get that. So then after after the rock group happened, you know, I ended up working um, for Whitney Houston's father, and that's, that was, like, the biggest game changer for me was working for John Houston. And I, and I have to ask as well, because that was actually in my question list. When you said you were working for John Houston, of course, like, of course you obviously ran into Whitney Houston. I have to ask, like, wh uh, what was it like just being around her so early on in your career? Because she's known as one of the, mo one of the most biggest singers to ever grace, the, to ever grace this earth. She was, the, she was the greatest because I was telling my girlfriend that, you know, last week, like, just being around her, like, in Alpharetta, Georgia, like, in her house, like, it was, like, she would just walk around and sing, and it was, like, one of those moments where you just wanted to stop time, because it's, like, holy shit, you know, and you just gotta be quiet and pretend, like, it's not happening, but it's, like, Whitney Houston is just walking around the fucking house singing, you know, it's, it's, so it, was, it was very, you know, it was very surreal, so, and when I met Whitney Houston, she, like, cussed me out, and as she was cussing me out, I was thinking, oh, my God, I wish my friends could see this, because I have Fuck, he made it. Like, fuck everybody. I don't know if I can cuss on your radio station. Oh, most, we're completely uncensored. Have at it. Okay. But I was just like, fuck everybody. Fuck my dick. Like, I made this motherfucking shit. Whitney Houston sitting here cussing me out. But, um, you know, she be we became really, really close. But a lot of people don't realize, like, 
towards the end of her life, she was very irrelevant. You know, she was only relevant for her and Bobby Brown and being a drug addict, so we weren't getting any shows. We weren't selling records. And people don't realize that. It's like, when Michael died, then he became iconic. But when Michael was alive, he was a freak show. You know, same with Whitney Houston. So, you know, nobody took it seriously. All her credibility was, was totally shot because, you know, she couldn't make shows, you know, because she couldn't stay sober. Um, and it was really sad. It was really hard to deal with because she was, like I said, she was walking around singing in the kitchen. And she had to, I mean, it was just unreal. You know, they, she's the best singer I've ever heard, you know. For sure. Also, one of your uh, one of your first professional projects was actually the Australian hip hop duo called Quo. I was wondering how did that opportunity come to be for you, and of course, what was it like being in the studio working with those two talented individuals? You see, that was that was in that studio in college, that downtown Louisville, and Quo came about with Michael Jackson's group. I thought that it would be something that would explode because the kids were, you know, really really young and they could break dance and they were. They had a big single, but, you know, they didn't really break. And that, that Wade, that Wade um, Robinson, he's one of the guys who came out and accused Michael Jackson of the stuff that's going on. He, he's in the group quote. He's one of the accusers. So that it's kind of weird. You know what I mean? Yeah, I actually did not even know that. But I, I got to say, though, if someone's putting you on, man, and definitely getting just bringing you up, especially on their label, man, like, I don't know, my, me, me personally, I never believed that Michael Jackson stuff. So just hearing that, in my personal opinion, is like an, an individual that brought you up, putting you on game, you know, giving you a career pretty much and a chance, you know, and you're pulling that crap. I, I don't know. I, I personally think that's disrespectful, man. You should have appreciated that opportunity much more. Absolutely. I, I also think Michael is innocent, 100%. Well, I'm, I'm, I am mean, personally, I most definitely agree as well. I always thought that, man. Like, I, I always thought he was the way he was because, you know, as if you know Michael Jackson history, you know he never had that childhood. So growing up and you have a shit ton of money, buy a Ferris wheel. You know what I mean? Like, I would. <laughs> Absolutely. And he, was so, and he was so sheltered. You know, he had no, like, and he was famous since he was five years old. He had hit records when he was five years old. So, like, seven years old. Eight years old. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he was he was so famous for so long. That's all he knew. So he had to live this, you know, crazy sheltered life. And the one thing I have to ask, like, aside from, you know, the whole controversy with Michael Jackson, because that's what I, a lot of people always talk about. But I, I, I want to ask this, man, because me personally, like, I never, obviously never had the opportunity to meet Michael. But well, what was he actually like off the stage, like, just as Michael Jackson? Like, what was it like just being around him, man? Because that, that's the king of pop. Yeah, you were never around him. Michael Jackson was a, you know, like, Walmart or Sam Walton. He's like that. He just wasn't around. You know, Michael Jackson's business. He's one part, he's the main part, obviously, of the whole Michael Jackson brand, which is like a Nike, you know, so you just really didn't see him. You were dealing with, you know, Teddy Riley and Bruce Swedeen and his management or this musician named Yuri Geller. <laughs> so it was very wild. But it was awesome because, you know, as you, as you do interviews and stuff and journalism, when you sometimes meet people, it humanizes them, humanizes them it's almost... It's almost disappointing. Like, I was such a Public Enemy fan, like, like diehard, like, favorite all time, Public Enemy. And so when I, like, met Chuck D, I was, like, sort of disappointed. And we clicked and we talked for, like, three hours, and it was the most amazing conversation. He, he changed my life with so much game and knowledge. And, but it humanized him to the point where it's like, wow, you know, I just met my hero. You know, Jimmy Sonnen fan, I just met my hero. Like, this is crazy, you know, where you can't. You know, they're on such that pedestal. It was an amazing time, you know, and Chuck gave me so much knowledge, but at the same time, you know, humanizing. So it was like, it, 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 it's different. Sometimes I don't want to meet, like, you know, the big artists or celebrities or movie stars or whatever because it humanizes them. You know, you want to keep that distinct, you know? And also, so, oh, so sorry about that, John. My apologies. So with Michael Jackson, it was that. It was that whole, you know, it was that whole mystique. It was, you know, it was bigger than life. Everything he did, every movement was bigger than life. Like, even him, you know, at the Neverland Ranch to go, you know, across, you know, to the studio or anything. It's, it's, it, all of it was a production constantly. You know, he was always in, 
what you don't want to say character, but it was always a Michael Jackson persona and character, so it just seems to be that's who he was. You know what I mean? Oh, like, I- it didn't seem like a character, you know, but he was over the top in every way, every way shape. And, you know, a, a lot of people can always talk bad about Michael, but they can never take away his legacy, man. Like, he, he I, I mean, my, my personal opinion, and, and any, anything that man touched musical-wise went, went pure platinum. You know what I mean? That song, Beat It, is still always going to be my favorite my favorite Michael joint of all time. Yeah, me too. I like Billie Jean. And also... But I, work, I work in that, dude, like, the guy, Bruce Swedeen, is, uh, he, he did all of Michael Jackson's you know, all of his records off the wall up until his very last record, you know, Invincible when he was alive. You know, and then he put out his, you know, the Michael record after he passed. But those records, it was all Bruce Woody. He was the engin- engineer throughout all the projects. He was with Quincy Jones. He worked with Teddy Riley. He worked with all Michael's producers. Bruce Woody was the one common person in his life. And so I, I got to, you know, work with Bruce Woody. He became a mentor. So I got to work on like the Harrison console where they recorded like Beat It and Thriller and Billy Jean and the mics that Michael Jackson used and it's it was it's unreal some of the stuff that I've been through, you know. And As a fan, because I was a I was a huge Michael Jackson fan, like Love the Blood, like the whole thing. You know? And I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest, me personally, I still can't believe that Michael's gone, man, because his music still speaks and makes waves today. Even when you listen to it, it still feels like he's there. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Agreed. I love Michael. You know, but, you know, Prince is another one. Prince is iconic. Prince, Prince stayed in, like, the, the, the character, you know, and I, I think that's what I like. I like to see the hip-hop now, like, a lot of the, you know, the heads, you know, because I suck with the old heads as well, you know, because I'm an old head myself. So, it's like, they, like, sometimes hate on the kids, but it's like, I, I really like what the kids are doing now, like, I really, I really like their fashion and their dress and their clothes and their, their, they take a lot of risks, you know, and they're real wild and real flashy over the top, like, because it's performance art. That's something that Chuck D always talks about is, you know, this is like, it's performance art, it's character. So, like, Michael Jackson and Prince, their persona was so bigger than life, as you know, their character was just ridiculous. Well, Whitney Houston, she didn't have that kind of persona. She was just a flat-out, just saying, no, no gimmicks, no tricks. She just showed up and sang, and it was amazing, you know. But Prince and Michael Jackson, they put on shows that were iconic. You know? And speaking of Prince, your first notable production collaboration was actually with the late great with. Prince. I was actually wondering, man, like, what was one of your most memorable memories you actually shared with the late great Prince, man? Because it must have just been cool being able to just work alongside him and be be able to chop it up with him. You did, you, but he was one of those things too. You didn't get to, you didn't get to do that kind of stuff. You know, you just, you just stay, you know, you just stay away and kind of wait. You know, because you're so like freaked out. Like any kind of situation, so like it's like, just like you just gotta play it normal. Like okay, this is like what's happening. You know, and you're going to the bathroom, like throwing up. You know, because you've done a bunch of cocaine with someone, and it's like, you know, it's just like calling. You know, my mother, my family, and I don't have a panic attack. You know, because you're with these with these people so never like any like Chuck D was like because I was more of a fan of Chuck D than Michael Prince any of them public enemy like I said so like he was he changed my life he, we had a three hour conversation that, you know changed my life and changed my business inside my infrastructure and he was using sports analogies for everything and Chuck D is a person you should definitely talk to you should definitely have him on your show um because he is just he's brilliant he's so it's, it's like he's incredible. So to be able to pick up his brain, I could never do that with uh, Michael and uh, Frank or anybody like that. But Whitney, Whitney, you could. Whitney was always around. You know, Whitney's Whitney's father was around. They were so cool. You know, Whitney, like I said, Whitney, she wouldn't want to be famous. <clears throat> you know, so she would just go around. You know, Atlanta, just you know, doing the most. She was happy to be in a relationship with Bobby Brown. She was just trying to be as normal as possible. You know, but she had this extraordinary talent that. She really didn't want to have, you know. And you also worked as a publicist as well over at Death Row Records. I was wondering, how did you initially get connected with Suge Knight? And of course, what was it like working for that notorious imprint? Death Row Records was awesome. Um, when I came above, when I when I got involved with Death Row Records, it was after 
you know, Tupac had passed, and it was when the, the, the label was in, you know, shambles. And then I was involved with the Canada company, um, Wide Awake Entertainment, that purchased Ezra Records. I was involved in all that stuff. It was, it was, it was bittersweet because it wasn't like the same Death Row staff. You know, I spoke to Suge Knight. I spoke to Suge Knight, you know, uh, several times. Totally cool. Met Suge Knight, sweetheart. You know, like his, the reputation that they say about him. You know, it's like a lot of people have met like that. Like he was like the most straight up, coolest, you know, sweetest, like he was like a teddy bear, you know what I mean? He was like totally, totally cool. Not, he didn't sound have that game or song or anything like that. You know, you can't, like that was all what the media did for show and everything else, but you can't sell that many records. Like he got sold very boy. You know, you can't sell that many records and not be highly intelligent, you know? Shirt Knight is a mogul of every sense of the word. And I gotta say, even even to this day, you know what I mean. Death Row Records is known as one of the biggest hip hop labels to ever exist. You know what I mean? Like they, they put together absolute classics that people still enjoy today. Absolutely, absolutely, no question. And also, man, yeah. you you were actually part of the announcement when it when uh, Death Row Records catalog was actually sold to Hasbro. I have to say, man, because like like you said, you grew up listening to Public Enemy. You're a hip hop head just like myself. So, what was your take when you actually heard Hasbro bought Death Row Records? Because that to me that just sounds so different for Hasbro to buy, like you know, Death Row. Well, listen, like I felt good about it. It was definitely weird. Like, I saw all the, the memes and stuff, which were hilarious. But it, it's good because Death Row, something that powerful, something that that big, it needs to have a major corporation, it needs to have major capital, it needs to have major resources, it needs to have that kind of, because, you know, that Death Row, there's nothing bigger than hip hop. You know, because that birth, you know, that was, that was Dr. Dre that can come around after NWA and he was, like, done. You know, and you know, then you have Snoop Dogg, you know, who's still relevant today, and then Shug, and then obviously Tupac, which was, you know, the you know the biggest of the biggest of all time, you know. So Death Row Records was was iconic, and then of course like, you know, Dads and Corrupt, you know, like all those guys, and then you know Crooked Eye came from Death Row, you know, and, and which is you know from Slaughterhouse and all that. Like Death Row is like so impactful, and uh, Shug Knight is just. He's, a, he's an icon. You know, people, you know, they've given, like, you know, slandered him. You know, like, baby, put some respect on his name. But people really have to respect him tonight for what he did to, you know, the fucking world. You know? Tupac's music is, you know, that the death row stuff that they were doing changed the world. And, and I got to say, man, I, I definitely agree, you know? Like, I look at it as everybody makes mistakes in life, you know what I mean? But... You, you can't take away what that man created musical wise because like I like like you said he created a mogul man that you know is like still irrelevant and still worldwide today absolutely but but still Hasbro having those resources having that kind of power could do something with death row because like when Wild Awake took over I don't want to bomb on them you know but they they couldn't handle the legacy of something that major how could you you know, and then there's all the disputes with the with two boxes of state, you know, that's now, you know, his mother's past. He didn't have any children. He wasn't married, you know, so he didn't so he doesn't really have any like heirs. So, you know, as a state, you know, it's just kind of there. You know what I mean? So like it, like you gotta be able to and then the the bad blood between Doctor Dre and Shug Knight. You know, so and, and Dr. Dre was the biggest hit maker. So there's all these, there's all this red tape and there's all this, you know, craziness that it takes somebody like a Hasbro to, you know, sort through all that stuff to, uh, you know, to make it, you know, to be what it should be. You know, like I brought, I brought one of my friends is Big Harvest, and he's uh, he brought Snoop Dogg to the table for Death Row, and I was bringing in uh, Snoop Dogg. He was going to take over the Death Row Records with a lot of wake guys. And, you know, they, could, they couldn't agree to it. So I, I mean, uh, Snoop Dogg was like, you know, I get to have my baby back. He put together a deal for them to meet. <laughs> let Shug Knight run it. I mean, let Snoop Dogg, sorry, let Snoop Dogg run it. And uh, they didn't, I don't know why that never happened. So, but 
so my point is I'm really glad that that uh that Hasbro has not come and I gotta say, Hasbro is doing some pretty cool things with Death Row right now. Cause like, I don't, I don't know if you follow them on social media, but they actually been dropping like uh, re re releases of like the vinyls and the cassettes and the CDs, and they've been putting together some pretty dope 30th anniversary anniversary merchandise as well. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's what it means. You know, he's he's he's, he's iconic. You know, he's Jimi Hendrix. You know, he's John Lennon. You know, he's that caliber. You know, he needs that kind of. You know, he needs to Elvis Presley. He needs that kind of, uh, you know, uh, backing behind him for that kind of legacy. Because last year I worked with, uh, you know, Biggie's estate, and uh, that went, you know, that that went, uh, the news went viral because I did the Eric Bean Rock Him, you know, for the leader of the Imagine the Jazz, and like when I did that record, you know, we put it out on the anniversary date of all the leader. You know, never being Rock Him did it. We did it as an instrumental album. And then where all of Rock Him's, you know, all his rap vocals were redone with the saxophone, we did it as jazz. <laughs> he put it out on a Friday, and that Sunday I was actually with Eric Bean Rock Him. I didn't even know them or anything. And so once they saw that I put out the album on the release date, same track listing, same order sequence, same 11 songs, you know, they, you know, we, we, we formed a partnership and we collaborated. And we put out the album together, you know, with Eric Bean Rock Him. And once Rock Him, you know, the God in C, you know, the people say the greatest rapper of all time, definitely in the Mount Rushmore, Rock Him co signed me, you know, which was, you know, huge for my production. And that record, you know, hit number one on Billboard Jazz, and it stayed on the Billboard Jazz charts for 11 weeks. That's almost three months, you know, we were in the top 10. <clears throat> and so once we did that, it kind of set up like, hey, let's do. You know, let's do a cover album. You know, let's do another cover album. Who can we do? So we were out in New York because we were promoting, you know, that, you know, Eric B. and Rockham were doing jazz clubs, we're doing press, you know, we're doing shows, you know, with our saxophones there. <clears throat> you know, we're doing all these things. This is obviously right before COVID. And so uh, I met this, this girl, Sarah Rush, fourth is her name, and she started introducing me to House. And, uh, you know, but like the house EDM scene, EDM is a scene that you don't say in like the house techno world, that's a bad word, but, you know, she introduced me to that because she was like, your jazz, the jazz music you do, it sounds very kind of almost like house music techno-ish, could you do techno? I was like, of course. So she, she started taking me to like underground parties and raves, something I've never seen because I've been a hip hop head my whole life. And that like changed my whole life. So I was like, holy shit. And so I got real immersed in, like, the, the house scene. So we decided to do Biggie, because we're out in Brooklyn. And we decided to do Biggie, we imagined as uh, house techno. So when we did Biggie, you know, we cut the album, bro. It was so crazy. And one week later, I was on the phone with Biggie's son. And he wanted to meet us in Los Angeles. So we went out to L.A., sat down with Biggie's son. You know, we came up with a deal. And then we put out Big Papa, and then he was on viral. And it was a little bit strange, because, like, when I was doing Eric B. and Rakim, I was, I was recording in Quad Studios. And that's the studios, you know, where Tupac, you know, was shot, which started the East Coast, West Coast, you, you know, dispute. I was in Quad making that record, and I was like, you know, being a Death Row guy, I saw all the Biggie stuff. So it was her idea, you know, to do Biggie. And at first, I'm kind of like, man, I don't want to do Biggie. You know, I'm a Tupac guy. You know, but it just, it just made sense because, you know, because Biggie has a lot of dance music. You know, a lot more, more danceable, more upbeat. You know, and I was out in Brooklyn, like spending time in Brooklyn. I saw another Brooklyn. And now it's like, you know, of course, this really studying Biggie that much, being in Brooklyn, being in bed being all over Williamsburg. Like, I've got family now in Brooklyn. I love Brooklyn. And I wouldn't have any of that if it wasn't for the for, for the Biggie project. You know, so I'm so glad that, that we did that. So that started, you know, like the house and, you know, techno type thing that I'm doing now, you know. And also, as well, as you were talking about the uh, the partnership there with uh, Eric B. and Rakim, man, uh, I Follow the Leader, man, is a phenomenal, phenomenal project. And for the listeners that don't already have themselves a copy, do you, do you, is there any hard copies available that our listeners can actually snag themselves a copy if they haven't already done so? Absolutely. So Fat Beast is our distributor. You know, Fat Beast is an iconic, you know, hip-hop force. And Fat Beast, we have vinyl, we have cassette and CDs. You can get them anywhere from, 
you know, you can go to Target, Walmart, go on the site, you can go to FabBeats.com, you can go to Tower Records, Best Buy, or just go to Amazon, eBay, they're all over, you know, the vinyl, the custom CDs everywhere. You know, because they're, they're so, they printed so many of them. I'm like a vinyl head, so like we have this Nirvana project coming out. It was supposed to come out July 30th, but we pushed it back so we could have the vinyl, so we could be closer to the vinyl, so people weren't waiting as long, because it takes, obviously, longer to press vinyl, but, you know, we do all our distribution through Fabbeats. Fabbeats is, that's another guy, the owner of Fabbeats, he's allowed him on your show, because he could tell you some iconic hip-hop stories, because he's like, you know, he's like one of the gods of uh, hip-hop distribution. And also, break, just God, going back to when you mentioned the Nirvana project, because I saw a little bit about that before we actually hopped on the airwaves, and and I, I obviously know you guys, you can't let too too many cats out of the bag because it's not released yet. But from what you can tell us, uh, like what can our listeners expect when this phenomenal project drops? Because I was reading that article you posted on your Facebook, and it it just seems like a very unique and phenomenal project. It is, and like as as a hip hop head you know, to do, like, Nirvana, but see, I grew up in that era, like, so when you, you were listening to the rap, when Smells Like Teen Spirit came on, it's like, everybody who liked rap liked that shit, you know, everybody who liked hip-hop liked Nirvana, like the whole grunge thing, so, you know, I've always been, like, a, you know, a fan of Nirvana and Pearl Jam and, you know, Stone Temple Pilots and, you know, like, you know, all those rappers, so, like, we were out in New York, and it just kind of it just kind of happened, you know. So the, the Nirvana thing came together. So it's like it, it, it's been really cool. And like house music and hip hop is so similar, you know, because you know most hip hop, you know, much of the roots is you know electronic music. You know, it's mostly you know beats. It's it's so it's like instead of having all the you know the rap, the lyrics, you know, you you just got the you know it's mostly on music, and then you're just like you know, take keywords and sample keywords and stuff like that. You know, you know what I mean? So I love house music. It, like, does have the culture. Like, when I'm in house parties and I'm in raves and stuff like that, you see all the hip-hop acts, too, you know? So it's, it's, it's really, it's really cool. Totally into So anyway, with Nirvana, it was a challenge. Like, I like to take care of me and Rakim. We made that jet, you know? So where it's like where all of Rakim's flows and his cadences, we would do that with um, saxophone and jazz. You know, we have jazz musicality doing that, you know, bending genres like that. So when we did, you know, Nirvana, taking that from, you know, real grungy rock to real bright house music, you know, it uh, it, it was a lot of fun. It was challenging. We, we, you know, made some Nirvana fans upset. Like, you know, I've got an email or someone's like, you know, I don't know why you would, you know, want to do this to Kurt Cobain. He hated techno music. He hated house music. But... You know, who cares? Like, like to me, it's like, that's what I like about house music. It's all about love and positivity. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's positive. And, and Nirvana did have a darkness to it, just like Biggie has a darkness to it. I mean, Biggie was, you know, he was gunned down. He was murdered. His music was dark. His content that he was promoting was dark, gangster rap. So it's like, I like to give it a different spin on, you know, like taking dark music and make it positive and make it uplifting. Because, you know, four years ago, I was in the home invasion, you know, with my, with my daughter while I was duct taped and your health for two hours. It was a very traumatic thing. When I was duct taped, I was thinking about the content, you know, that I was doing at the time. Like, holy shit, I'm promoting this content that is now at my doorstep and I'm duct taped and my daughter's on the ground, you know, thinking that I'm going to die. And so, the, you know, the three, three, the three people, they pled guilty, you know, they're in prison now. You know, we've worked through all that, but that's what, that was a game changer for me. That's when I started doing jazz music. That's when I started, like, okay, I'm only going to do, you know, positive music. I don't, you know, so a lot of people try to get me to do hip-hop and stuff like that, but I just try to stay out of it, right, because I don't want that negative energy from what I've been through. Like, I love hip-hop, you know, the darker, the better, the gangster, the more, you know, shit like that, but, you know, I just like to, I like to stay positive, you know, so that's, that's why I'm on my life right And honestly, it's completely yeah, understandable. Next year, I have to be back in hip-hop. Like, fuck everybody. Thug life, let's go. You know, but right now, you know, it's like, it's a, you know, I'm just not really, I'm just focusing on, like, positive music. 
and and I want to say I don't want to dive too uh, too much into like that situation, but I do want to say that like I remember hearing that on the news uh, you, uh, a few years back, and this is before I got into the music industry. And I, I'm I'm just want to say I'm really glad that you and your family are okay during that terrible event, man. I'm glad that we are able to talk right now and be able to do this dope interview live on my radio station airwaves. So I just want to say I'm glad your family's okay. It was it was a it was a game changer as much as like. It was the worst thing that I've ever been there because me, my daughter and I both thought for sure we were going to die. But it changed everything. Like, it changed. Like, if, if, if that didn't happen, I didn't do Eric B. and Rakim. I didn't do Biggie. I'm not doing Nirvana. I'm not doing, you know, all the stuff that I'm doing. I'm, you know, it's, it, it just changed, it changed everything. It changed everything about my life. So it's just about taking a positive and turning into a negative situation. Only thing about the home invasion, and we actually did a documentary you know, the guy who his name is J.T. Barnett, you know, he was like one of the original producer and directors of the Tiger King, which, you know, last year was a fucking phenomenon. But him and I have been friends for like 10 years or so. I reached out to him. And so we found a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, like, you know, in Brooklyn and, and um, in Los Angeles and Dallas, Texas, which I'm at now. And he, he filmed a lot of this stuff. And so I've got, we've got footage that we're going to start to put together you know, uh, you know, like a, a docu series. It's called House Invasion. You know, that talks about from that home invasion. You know, and playing words to house invasion to going into house music and dating into house music. You know, doing all the stuff that 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 we're doing. You know, so that that really ties in, like this whole pandemic. You know, the whole pandemic. I've been working. You know, on the docu series, on the Biggie project, now the Nirvana project. You know, we've already started on another project that we're doing. So we have, it's been so much work, 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 you know. And also, I have to ask Jonathan, because I do know that we only touch base on like a sliver of your legendary career within the music industry this evening. But I, I, of course, other than the Biggie, the Nirvana, the docu series, is there anything we happen to miss? Anything else you still want to talk about while we stub you here live on the Canadian airwaves? Well, so I, I do. So I'm, I'm, I'm smoking a joint at the same time. So I'm just like, <laughs> everywhere so I'm going to go back to like so at the house invasion the real thing for me in that show is because there's three people in prison right now <clears throat> and there's one person my ex that I was with for nine years she like threatened this very thing that happened there was a, res there was a restraining order against my ex and um, there was you know there was a no contact so while I'm duct taped and when we got out, I was like, okay, this bitch is going to jail. You know what I mean? Like, she threatened us to please know, you know, that because there's a restraining order. But she was never, uh, she was never charged. She was never even interrogated. And she threatened me saying, you know, there's a restraining order. But there's three African Americans in jail. And the uh, police, like I said, they didn't even interrogate her. So one of the reasons that I'm doing house invasion and one of the reasons that I'm doing the stuff that I'm doing now is to finally get justice because there's one person out there that knows something, whether she's involved in it or not, but she was dating the guy that's in prison. This is my ex. She was dating him. You know, she was, like, promoting it on her Facebook that they were in a relationship even after that he was charged. So it's like, all right, you know, we were together nine years. And, you know, <laughs> the, when, when the guys are in my place looking for safe, looking for stuff that only she knew, taking her cameras, and then I got with Lisa Bloom, who was a real high-powered entertainment lawyer. Lisa Bloom got the case files. I'm listening to the case files, and they're talk the guys who are in jail are talking about, because the guys are actually in my place. It was set up by this guy who's in prison. He was dating my ex, but he didn't go in my place. He's, the two other guys that were in my place who, you know, they were the ones who were doing the most, you know, doing all that crazy shit. <clears throat> they were saying, because they didn't know her name, they were saying in the interrogation files to the cops, well, it had something to do with his girlfriend, his girlfriend, his girlfriend, his girlfriend. And they never even interrogated her. Though. So I definitely want to get justice there, and I'm definitely going to fight it. I'm definitely going to sue the police department. I'm definitely going to sue everyone involved. So, like, that's why... I, I'm, I'm raising my profile right now to bring justice to that thing to put that to bed once and for all. 
and I gotta say, I don't, I don't blame you, man. It sounds like it sounds like one giant, huge inside job, in my personal opinion, man. And I don't blame you. Without for... question. Without question. Especially because I had my daughter; she was fourteen years old, and she went through that. And our relationship has never been the same. She's an she's an amazing singer. She's an amazing artist. But you know, here she is, you know, fucking with her dad, and next, you know, now she's going through this traumatic shit. You know, so it's like, it, I, you know, I've definitely lost. You know, trust in her. You know, because like, what, what what do I have going on in my life where something like this is gonna happen? You know, and then, but you know, like I said, the guys they felt guilty, they apologized, they went and did their time. I just I think it's crazy that my ex who had an EPO against her, had an EPO against her, who threatened my daughter, who threatened this very thing, was never even talking to her. <clears throat> so that's a that's a problem. So. Anyway, so got through that, started doing the jazz music, started doing house music. That's kind of, that, that, that's where I'm at, you know. So, and uh, the Nirvana Project is super awesome. I'm super excited. It is coming out this month. We did 27 songs. Like I said, Grammy just did a story for us. It's on my Instagram. We did 27 songs, the highlight. You know, it's been 27 years since Kurt Cobain died, and he died at 27. So we have 27 songs. And it's a, it, it's been a wonderful project, really diving in and exploring, you know, Kurt Cobain, learn, learning about all his social issues with LGBTQIA+, plus, and his, his women rights, he's a feminist. So it's like we really got to tackle that message, and we, we really bring that message in the music, you know, so I'm excited for everybody to hear it. It most definitely, that, that Nirvana project most definitely sounds phenomenal. I, I like the concept, how you did 27 songs based on the 27th year of his passing and of course of how old he was when he passed as well i think that's i think that's really unique that you guys put so much thought into this record so i can just imagine how amazing every single 20 every single song on that project's going to be absolutely absolutely yeah and then right after this we're, we're going right into another hip-hop reimagination so it's really it's really cool there's a lot of cool things on that head. And also, John, aside, uh, this is the time in the interview quickly that I give a chance for the individual that does slide into the radio station airwaves. Uh, just a chance to give, like, shout-outs to whomever they want to give shout-outs to. But most of all, man, your social media handles. That way our listeners can follow you and stay updated on everything everything you're doing, music-wise, publicist-wise, and, of course, everything Jonathan Hay. Just my, my socials. People can just Google me and find me, but... Uh... Because I hate my Instagram handle, I don't want to say that. Well. Um, but my Instagram is, is, is there. I don't post enough, like on my page. Like I post like once a year. You know, I'm trying to get my uh, trying to get my girlfriend to take over and run my social media for me. So it's like, okay, all my socials are verified. I'm not doing shit with this stuff because it's like, you know, I'm not forty. Like I don't really know what the fuck to do with this shit. You know what I mean? So it's like I'm, I need I need help. If anybody's listening, contact me. You can help me. Because I definitely uh, don't really understand the social media stuff, and I really don't <laughs> have anything to do with it. But I understand, you know, the value of it, you know. So, um, yeah. So, but my handle is my Instagram. It's search Jonathan Hey. You'll find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. It's all there. But I gotta say first and foremost, John, thank you so much, man, for just taking a little bit of your time this evening and coming on my radio station airwaves. It definitely is an honor and most definitely a privilege to welcome one of the biggest, not only publicists, but also producers in the music industry on my radio station airwaves, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's an honor. I appreciate it, man. I see all your posts and I see like I see the people that you you guys are interviewing, you guys are interviewing some real like hip hop heads and some real important people that don't get enough light for the genre and the culture for what they started. Like, so I really like appreciate you. So shout out to you for like, you know, really shedding, you know, a light on some of the underground stuff and some of the very, you know, the important, the, the important backbone of, you know, like such a like hip hop culture and stuff. It's like, I, I appreciate you, you know, so, so it's, it's dope, you know, shout out to everybody. Like, you know, shout out to, you know, Crooked Eye, Keep Crooked. You know, that's, that, that's my dude. Like, you know, um, I'm going to put this out there so hopefully to hear this. Like, after the home invasion happened, this girl, she moved in with me, her name was Ronna Royce. You know, she was busy going back for five years. She was like my homie. She was my dog. She was like my friend. She was like, 
she's like my best friend, but she really came in and she picked me up at a time that I was devastated, bro. Like, I was duct taped and robbed. I was like, you know, I gained so much weight because I just gave up on life, you know what I mean? And so, like, she came in and really, like, picked me up and, and helped me out and, like, you know, got me back focused. And then, you know, we had this, like, falling out as, like, you know, relationships do and not a relationship where it's, like, anything else. You know, there's, like, a lot of stress from, like, Busy Bones fans. You know, because she was engaged to Busy Bone. So anyway, she lived with me for two years. And in that relationship, you know, our friendship and our business, you know, went sour. And she was so instrumental into, like, helping me get back on my way to recovery. You know, and then so, you know, it's good to see her. Like, she's, like, doing stuff with Crooked Eye. Crooked Eye's really looking out for her, really taking on her wings. So shout out to Ron Royce. You know, shout out to Crooked Eye. Shout out to Busy Bone. Shout out to everybody that, you know, I, I've worked with that, you know, it inspired me, you know, shout out to hip hop, everything. So shout out to Nirvana, music, whatever, you know. So And I gotta say first and foremost, John, I appreciate the love, man, that you actually mentioned. I I, I do what I do for the love of hip hop, man, and I try and look for the for the legendary individuals that never really got their shine or don't get their shine anymore. You know, a lot of people they just nowadays on the radio they just think about this mumble stuff, but they they really forget about the legendary individuals that paved the way for every other artist. Exactly, and and, and as you know too, it's like <clears throat> that's what I said. Like with like Michael Jackson and Prince, and you know the big groups like now Justin Bieber, all that. They 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 are they are just one piece of a puzzle of you know of, of a team like Drake. You know, like I you know I got to work with Drake. You know, like like OVO is so small. You know, like, Drake's team is so fucking small. Like, insanely small. Because, like, and it, and it, it's so small and it's so effective because right now Drake doesn't even need a team. He puts it up on his Instagram story, it's viral. That's it. That's all he, did. That's all he has to do. You know, like, that's how strong he is. And, you know, this is the last thing I want to say is, like, Drake doesn't get enough credit, like, you know, because I'm a, I'm a head like you. Like, most of my friends, will argue about the greatest of all time. You know, Jay-Z to me is number one, Eminem is number two, but Jay-Z, you know, you know, got him see. But, like, Drake deserves to be on that Mount Rushmore, like, top five, because, like, bar for bar, he's going to slaughter you. He's got the, you know, I mean, he destroyed, you know, we saw what he did in his battles, like, people who challenged him, except Pusha C, they did in his back. But, you know, but still, like, Drake is, you know, he's a god. And, like, when you look at his material... Like, he is definitely top three, in my opinion. You know, like, Drake, and he, he does it so independent. You know, he doesn't have that real machine by, behind him. He is the, he became the machine. OVO is a fucking powerhouse. So it's awesome to see Drake do what he's done, you know. It's just, it's just phenomenal, you know. So shout out to Drake. And especially being a Canadian artist as well, man. Like, sometimes, especially here in Canada, it's really hard to actually get known you know what I mean? Even with the internet as a Canadian artist, I've heard that multiple times by a lot of Canadian artists, even outside of hip hop, that like even with social media, once a lot of people hear Canadian, they're like, oh, pff, whatever. And you know, I forgot about that, that, that you say that, like, because you know, he's just so big, he's universal, and he's, you know, he's in LA, you just think about him almost being an American artist. But I forgot, yeah, Canada, like, holy shit. You know, I didn't even, obviously I knew that, but you know, it's like you don't even think about that anymore, but yeah, like, it's it's insane what what he's done, and like you you know you know as a head when you listen to his bars and his flows and his wordplay and come on he's a beast dude he's he, he he'll murder anybody so like I, I'm a, I'm a I'm a huge Drake fan I always done for the culture you know I, I love real I love real lyrics and I love real you know bars you know that's that's the kind of shit that I'm into like you know Chino XL and Slaughterhouse those guys Royce the Five Nine I had a friend who's a monster. He's one of my real good friends. He writes most of all of Kanye stuff. You know, he wrote a lot of Kanye stuff on the Donda album that's coming out. So I had a friend who's a monster. I love lyrics. I love bars. And Drake, he has all that. But I got to say, Jonathan, thank you so much, man, for just giving us a little bit of your time, man. It, it, like I said, it definitely was an honor 
uh, to welcome one of the best publicists and producers out there, man. Hopefully when this Nirvana project does drop to the general public, we can get you back on here and actually push this phenomenal project. Yeah, but this and last thing, too, shout out to everybody. Like, some of my hip-hop head friends, they're like, why are you doing this house shit? You know, like, house music. Like, you're not, you've changed. You're not a hip-hop guy. Like, fuck off. I'm hip-hop forever. You know, like, Naughty by Nature, I live in God for hip-hop. This is hip-hop of the day. hip hop the hip-hop, so hip-hop, all right. Fuck you guys. It's always rap. It's always hip-hop. That's never going to go. But it's, it's, it's been amazing to do, you know, this house techno music. I, I'm, I'm upset with the culture and the positivity behind it because of the negative stuff that I've been through. So I, I encourage everybody, like all the hip-hop heads, to like listen to house music, go to a rave, go you know, change your life because it is that same culture that, that, that we strive to have. It's just hard. I, I, I gotta say, I most definitely agree. You know, I, my, my old saying is, especially even being a DJ, you have to be transparent, you know. Uh, you know, a lot of people, they think you should just, if you're in, if you're in the music industry, you gotta be one genre, but, you know, that, that's how you stay relevant as well, is actually being transparent and actually, you know, showing love to all different types of cultures. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's still hip-hop to me, it's still beats, it's still art, it's still graffiti. You know, like, you see all these people, you know, a lot, a lot of people forget the fundamentals of hip-hop, which is, you know, breakdancing, breaking, you know, which is, you know, uh, graffiti which is the music, and it, 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 it embodies all that stuff. You know, it's, it's all art. It just doesn't have the, you know, the, the rap lyrics, you know, in it, but it's got the melodic stuff where you can come up with the rap on your own. You know, that's why it was cool to do the Biggie project, you know, that we're doing, because we're doing this instrumentals, and you're rapping along the Biggie's lyrics in your head, which is exactly what you want people to do, you know? And I gotta say, I'm most definitely looking forward to these brand new, amazing projects that are coming out here soon. But like I said, whenever yeah. they do drop, make sure you hit me up. We can definitely get you back on and promote these wonderful projects. Yes. All right, bro. Thank you, man. Thank you so much for having me on the show. You are most certainly welcome, man. Thank you so much again, and definitely have yourself a wonderful night out there.